You're listening to Medscape's In Discussion series on cancer survivorship, a podcast where thought leaders and clinical experts share their diverse insights and practical ideas for optimizing patient care. This series is hosted by Dr. Anne Partridge, Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, Vice Chair of Medical Oncology, Founder and Director of the Program for Young Adults with Breast Cancer, Director of the Adult Cancer Survivorship Program, and Eric P. Weiner, MD, Chair in Breast Cancer Research at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Relevant disclosures can be found with the episode show notes on Medscape.com or the Medscape app. The topics and discussions are planned, produced, and reviewed independently of advertisers. This podcast is intended only for U.S. healthcare professionals. Hello, I'm Dr. Ann Partridge of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Welcome to Medscape's In Discussion series on cancer survivorship. Today, we'll discuss models of care in cancer survivorship, which doesn't sound so exciting, but there's actually a lot of exciting work going on in this area, and it's super important given the growing number of cancer survivors out there. First, let me introduce my guest, Dr. Catherine Alfano. She's vice president in cancer care management and research at Northwell Health, based in New York. Welcome to In Discussion, Catherine. Can I call you Catherine? Please. Thank you. So one of the first things I'd like to ask you about uh, before we get into the details of what you're up to these days and, and all the important work is I'd like to know what drew you into this kind of specialty of the management of patient populations and cancer survivors in particular. Yes. And thank you, by the way, for the honor of being here with you today. This is such a thrill for me to be able to talk about something I'm so passionate about. You know, for me, this journey started very early. When I was 11 years old, my first grandparent died of cancer. That was my paternal grandfather. And he had been sick for about a year. And he was going to multiple doctors and nobody would listen to him. And it wound up by the time he was diagnosed, Uh, He had about four or five weeks between diagnosis and death, during which he received palliative chemotherapy that made him so tired, so fatigued, he wasn't able to say goodbye to his family. And my 11-year-old brain, I mean, I hadn't even lost a pet at this point in my life. My 11-year-old brain said, wow, there has got to be a better way to do this. And that started the work that has become uh, my life's work, basically. Well, I'd like to say that never happens anymore, but unfortunately it does still happen. Uh, And we do try very hard to do better supportive care for patients going through treatment, that group of survivors, as well as patients who are completed treatment, but living with the aftermath. Although of course, anybody listening knows that takes care of patients knows that uh, it's our work is imperfect at best. But how do you think about this in terms of, it feels like an overwhelming task to try and you know improve upon that, except for making better treatments. How do you approach that in terms of systems and models for which we can better serve our patients? And what are you doing right now to, to do that? As I know, you're working really hard on that at, at Northwell and beyond. So when I look around, uh, and from my previous two roles at the American Cancer Society and at the National Cancer Institute, you know, one of the things I was aware of is what's going right in the country and what's going wrong in the country. And one of the things that I think we need to do a better job of is in oncology, we're almost a victim of our own uh, success in our science, right? So our science has matured in oncology so much that oncologists have had to get hyper-specialized, right, in treating us not just breast cancer, but a specific type of breast cancer, for example. Uh, And you're accumulating more and more and more data in order to make clinical decisions. Because again, the science has matured, our treatments have matured, and that's been a wonderful thing in terms of increasing survival rates, improving our ability to help a patient survive from cancer. But the unanticipated consequence of that hyper-specialization of oncology is that we've lost the sort of country doctor approach, if you will, of being able to take a step back and look at a patient and say, what are all of the different things that are going on for you? Oh, you also have heart disease and diabetes, and those things have gone wonky as we've tried to to treat your cancer. Or, oh, you need help with social determinants of health, because while we're treating your cancer, you're having trouble putting food on the table for your family, right? So that focus in uh, anticipating what a patient's going to need going through cancer therapy uh, and beyond 
and then wrapping a team around that patient to address those needs in a way that isn't so fragmented and hyper-specialized. So how do we get that best of both worlds? We want the hyper-specialized folks because we want the, the latest and greatest in terms of technology to try and manage the cancer, but not forget how to manage a lot of the country doctor, the patient in their environment. So how, how do we get it both ways? Exactly. Right. So I think there are, there are some really exciting innovation going on in this space. Uh, so for example, one of the things we're doing at Northwell is we want that hyper-specialization. As you say, we need oncology to be hyper-specialized. We also have this incredible specialty clinicians that have come up. So cardio-oncology, onconephrology, cancer rehabilitation, uh, psychosocial care, all of these different programs and services that we have for patients, but they need to be stitched together around a patient. So how do we do that? What we're trying to do is embed a new kind of clinician alongside oncology from diagnosis forward, who we're calling an oncocomprehensivist. And this person is hybrid trained in general internal medicine and oncology so that they can anticipate what toxicities are going to come up for that patient, proactively watch out for those things, and then manage toxicities, manage comorbidity exacerbations, think about that person's long-term health and well-being, really help work hand-in-hand, arm-in-arm with oncology, and then bring in the incredible diversity of specialists and uh, programs and services around that patient as needed. So it would be way too much to try to expect oncology to try to do all of that. So we're actually introducing a new clinician onto the team who helps to do that. Now, is that a doctor? Is that a, a NP or PA or that nurse? Yes and yes. So we're introducing both physicians and uh, APPs. So we want that team to be all practicing at the top of their licenses. And the exciting thing about embedding this new clinician onto the oncology team is that it also solves for another pain point, which is that then, since that clinician and that team is already an arm of the oncology team and already knows the patient and the patient trusts them, they can be the ones to then uh, continue to care for that patient. For those patients who transition to post-oncology survivorship, the trust is already there. The clinician already knows that patient's cancer story and what they need, and the patient knows that that clinician has their back. We won't have survivors kind of transitioning from oncology to post-treatment survivorship saying, I don't really want to go to post-treatment survivorship. I want to follow with my oncology team because post-treatment survivorship doesn't know anything about what I'm going through and what, I've, what I need, right? So that divorce never happens in this new model. Right, because the person who knew them from the beginning has known them through, but it's not necessarily the oncologist. You know, Mayo has had a model like that for years, as I'm sure you know, in the breast group, uh, and I think in BMT as well. Although I don't think the docs in the primary care team that supports them follows them out for as long as I think, you know, like a primary care doctor would or in the same way. But I think it's a similar model. We have a model that uh, we call the oncogeneralist. Uh, that Larissa Nekladov, who I know you know, has filled for a long time, um, but she can't follow everybody, right? It's a scale problem because there's only so many of those uh, kinds of providers out there in Boston. It's hard to get a primary care. I don't know what it's like in New York, but I assume that it's also uh, a challenge, especially in the era of COVID. So how, how do you manage and are you managing that or is this new and how will you manage the scale problem? Right. No, that's exactly the right problem. And yes, in New York has the same problem Boston has. It's the same problem we're seeing all across the country. Uh, we do not have enough primary care workforce. So uh, at North World, we're going to try to train this workforce up, right? So we are starting a clinical training program for these hybrid trained clinicians. At the same time, though, this brings up another tenet of the innovation that's happening uh, all over the country. And I'm very excited to talk about this because we have to solve for that workforce shortage problem. And the only way that I can see out of that is through the development of non-one-size-fits-all approaches or personalized approaches to care. And as you know, I've been working uh, on behalf of the American Cancer Society, my, my former job with ASCO. In 2018, we brought a group together to talk about 
what the UK was calling risk stratified survivorship care. They've since kind of walked back that language a little bit because it's more than just based on your risk. Uh, it's really based on your needs, right? This idea of personalized survivorship trajectories. We're seeing this now in Australia and several other countries are innovating in this space. But the whole idea is basically that uh, if a patient comes through their cancer therapy and they have very low risk for recurrence, low risk of late effects, few issues to manage, really they can probably be transitioned to their primary care provider, assuming they have one, with some but very limited counsel about, okay, here's what you need to look out for. You're probably going to be great. Cancer is going to be this thing that happened to you. You've moved beyond it. Congratulations to you. Here's some things that you need to know. Um, we're going to work with you to educate you and your PCP on what those are, but you can go live your life. That's the low risk group. The, on the high risk group, these are people who probably need to be followed by a multidisciplinary team who's really looking out for them in a sort of healthcare intense way in a specialty clinic um, with remote monitoring outside clinic walls to make sure we're picking up late effects or picking up issues. These are folks who have high risk of re recurrence, high risk of subsequent cancers, high risk of a continuing morbidity. The classic examples here, of course, we know too many of our pediatric cancer survivors fall into this high risk group who are accumulating comorbidities at a much higher rate than their uh, peers who didn't have cancer. Also, folks who have things like head and neck cancers, some lung cancers, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's this middle risk, middle need group who probably should be followed by some sort of hybrid model. How we do that is really the difficulty that we're facing right now. But we have to be innovating toward this non one size fits all approach uh, if we're going to work our way out of the uh, healthcare sh workforce shortage problem. Yeah, and I know that a lot of people are trying to harness technology, especially for those kind of lower risk, quote unquote, as in lower need, but still might have need. And everybody can benefit from a little extra boost in terms of, you know, either health behaviors or some kind of management opportunity. And then to the higher needs, I know you guys are working on some models of, of harnessing technology and trying to uh, improve care for the population, particularly those that are no longer regularly in the oncology trenches um, who don't need active therapy and therefore aren't getting the same kind of touchdown in the clinics. What's going on there? That's a great question. Over a decade ago, the then Institute of Medicine, now National Academy of Medicine, put out a report that really drove home to me one of the critical problems that we're facing with the explosion of data. And that's that the number of pieces of data that it takes now to make a single clinical care decision, as you know from your own practice every day, that's increasing absolutely in a crazy way. But human cognitive capacity is remaining the same. So we're inundated with data. We're swimming with data to try to make better healthcare decisions. But our ability as humans to process and use those data has remained absolutely constant. So that to me suggests that we've got to insert technology into that space to help us address that disconnect between the data we're swimming in and how to use those data better. You know, back in 2018, I helped uh, lead on behalf of the American Cancer Society and the Oncology Nursing Society, a think tank in Washington, DC, on how to insert better health tech into care. And one of the folks that was there, one of the participants in the, in the workshop was from Silicon Valley. And she said this thing that will always stay with me. She said, you know, your problem in healthcare is that Nike knows how to use your data better to sell you the right pair of shoes than you know how to use your data in healthcare to personalize care. She's so right, by the way, right? She's completely right. Sure. So insert the idea that the National Academy of Medicine has been working on for a while now about a learning health system. What is a learning health system? To me, very simply, it's getting all your data streams integrated so that we can use a patient's data, data from the EHR, data from patient reported outcomes, data from imaging that gets ordered, data from genomic sequencing of tumors, 
uh, data from pharmacy records, right? Right now, these data exist, but they're completely fragmented, and a lot of them don't really drive care decisions that are being made. So a learning health system integrates those concepts of data, those streams of data up into the cloud for two reasons. And one of them, the first one is predictive analytics. And that's predicting, okay, using these data, we know we're about to put a patient on such and such chemotherapy regimen and they're going to be at risk for this toxicity. Or we know that this patient is about to experience financial hardship going through their cancer because we know that this is a problem for them, et cetera, et cetera. So predictive analytics, what's going to work best for a patient? How do we predict how that's going to go for a patient? And then those in the learning health system machinery get translated into prescriptive analytics. Okay, so we know their risk. What do we do about it? What do we prescribe to remedy that risk? So Importantly, then, we collect the outcomes of those care prescriptions in a learning health system and feed them back into a data cycle. So at the end of the day, what we have is a living, breathing registry of patients where that person's data, each patient's data, is helping to personalize their own care. And the collection of all of those cases is helping to personalize the care of all of the patients that come after that patient. Let me interrupt you there. So let's just, yeah, so I am a patient and I, or I'm, a, I'm a doctor with a patient and let's pretend you've got this system going. How does that work on the ground? Because I, you know, I, we've been talking about this now for a decade. Various groups have attempted to do this with various levels of success. There are a lot of data out there. I get the big picture, but how does that help me today as a patient sitting in the clinic, assuming it's up and running? Absolutely. So you're sitting there with your patient, you're just getting to know your patient, you've never seen them before. You want to be able to say to your patient, patients like you are best treated with X, or patients like you may develop this toxicity or that toxicity. And if that happens, we're going to wrap a team around you to address that. So don't you worry, right? It's that patients like you, right? We can't do that. We can't make those predictions without a big database running in the background that supports those analytics. The beautiful thing about why now, why can we do this now, is that uh, as you're well aware, and all of the listeners are too, American healthcare has been changing and that cancer care delivery systems are now much bigger than they used to be because they've been growing and gobbling up other healthcare delivery systems. And so as a result, there are more patients in any given system all across America than there ever have been before. We finally have the denominators that we need to run these big analytical projects. It sounds very cool. I hope it does come to fruition where we can use it uh, in any given system. And I think there are already pockets where it's it's being used at least in kind of pilot ways, although it is challenging. And then add in things like patient reported outcomes, not just what goes into it, our data sets, right? Because I might say they patients feel a certain way but the patients may you know, say a different thing. We know we're terrible as uh, clinicians at estimating some of the more subjective symptoms like you know, pain as well as uh, fatigue and things like that. So I, I, I look forward to seeing how these systems really roll out to, ta to tailor care. And I do think we will get there. I'm completely optimistic like you. I wonder though, if you could comment also you know, in survivorship, there are a lot of things that historically kind of go to the back burner or dare I say, fall off the stove if we're, you know, not focusing on it historically. And that's how survivorship has grown up as a field, because it tends to be the things that the oncologists treating disease haven't paid as much attention to, although increasingly doctors are and, and the providers that work with them. And I'm talking about nutrition and health behaviors and psychosocial health and sexual health fertility, all of those things. So I'm wondering how both in your system and from you know what you know about other systems, how do we get all that to patients so that they are able to access it, able to access it in a timely way, and at the same time, don't break the backs of the clinicians and are hyper-specialized? Does that go along with your model of the, the doc who rides along or the APP who rides along with them? Can they do all that? That is such a great question. And this, is this again, is one of the problems we're trying to fix out there because, again, we know from the decades now of survivorship science that 
there are problems that are ignored during cancer therapy. Our oncologists are incredible people doing very hard jobs. The issue is that in the absence of a system that asks patients how they're doing and does something with those data, what we know is that patients don't voice their concerns sometimes because they're thinking, I'm not going to tell my oncologist that. My oncologist is trying to save my life. The last thing I want to do is complain about my sexual problem, right? Or there is some concern about voicing those issues, right? So in the absence of a system for assessment, oncologists don't ask, patients don't voice, and so toxicities and problems and needs get missed. So the only way to remedy this problem is by inserting this system of comprehensively assessing what patients are going through. And this is where you just uh, a few minutes ago talked about electronic patient reported outcomes. That's the only way we have. We have to ask patients how they're feeling. We have to ask patients what's going on for them, what's going wrong for them, and what's going right. Otherwise, we don't know what to act upon. But then we have to critically connect those data that we get with workflow. I think you're aware, as I am, of the early studies of electronic patient reported outcomes where we assessed patient issues, but we didn't really connect that to workflow. And so what happened is patients got sick of filling out those assessments because they didn't do anything. <laughs> no one's listening. The tree was falling in the forest and nobody heard it, right? Yeah. Right, exactly. And the studies didn't really make a difference in the patient's outcome because they, they didn't connect it to workflow. It was really Ethan Bosch, right, whose game-changing study of connecting it to a nurse line showed us all, oh yeah, when you connect electronic patient out reported outcomes to workflow, you get the bang for your buck that we're looking for. So I think electronic patient reported outcomes are an absolutely critical component of that. Now, how do you connect that to workflow to get to the other part of your question that doesn't break the oncology team's back, right? And there again, what, how we're trying to innovate in that space is stepping up that new hybrid trained clinician and a navigator to help back end that care. So the, our new hybrid trained clinician, our oncocomprehensivist, is able to then take a look at that patient and say, I'm going to see this patient for you, oncology. Don't you worry. I'm going to assess this issue. If it's something I can treat, I'm going to treat that. Or I'm going to bring in the right referral, the right team member, so nutrition or exercise program integrative medicine programs, psychosocial oncology, cardio-oncology, psychosocial cancer rehabilitation, for example, right? So bringing in that larger team, so connecting the electronic patient reported outcome, the need that's been assessed to the solution for helping assess that need. One other piece of that that we haven't talked about yet is not all of this needs to be medical care, right? Some of this needs to be helping patients self-manage their issues to the fullest extent possible. You know, self-management is something that's the cornerstone of diabetes care, of asthma management. It's not something that we've talked about a lot in cancer. But really, truly, many, many times what patients need is just to be able to be counseled about what they can do to take the reins of control back over their life, whether that's what to eat or how much to exercise and where, what's safe for them. Uh, we need to have these be standard parts of oncology and survivorship care. Well, I think that that is a perfect way to end this because I think you hit the nail on the head, whether you're part of a big health system like yours and you can have a learning system that can inform people's care or whether you're a country doc still but delivering cancer care. I think we need to be asking patients, doing that review of systems, including around some of the supportive care needs they may not get to. You know, that can be using a smartphone or a tablet in the clinic, or it can be a paper and pen still. And people are still doing that. And, you know, check off things you want to talk about today to get it to surface, to have some counseling around what we can do better for an individual. And then, of course, I love the idea of kind of moving a population along, which I know you're, you're focusing on uh, for the, the population health aspects. This has been terrific. I really appreciate you meeting with me today, Dr. Alfano. Um, we've talked about how do we use technology to improve cancer care overall and cancer survivorship care? What are the models? What new models you're testing there? Uh, as well as how to kind of get patients to this care either remotely. And I would argue that we didn't touch on this too much, but you know, there's policy implications here too. 
uh, that we need to, you know, advocate for support and reimbursement for things like survivorship care and cancer rehab and all of the things that we know are important to, to those patients that need it. So wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. And navigation and remote patient monitoring, right? All of these things that are, are currently very difficult to, uh, to fund for health systems and the technology that we introduce into our care. Right. So thank you very, very much. Thank you for tuning in. If you haven't done so already, take a moment to download the Medscape mobile app to listen and subscribe to this podcast series on cancer survivorship. This is Dr. Ann Partridge for In Discussion. Thanks for listening to Medscape's In Discussion Cancer Survivorship podcast series with our host, Dr. Ann Partridge. Be sure to look for more In Discussion episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Check out Medscape.com or the Medscape app for show notes, links, and more information on cancer survivorship.